Hi, for this video what I want to do is show you how to do a two sample t-test when you have independent samples. And for this one we are not going to pool our data together. So I will discuss what all of those things mean. Um, with this I don't want to just show you how to run this in the TI Inspire graphing calculator, but I also want to show you all of the mechanics so that you can put everything down onto paper as well. So it will make the video a little bit longer, but um, it will give you all of the correct mechanics as well as how to enter it into your graphing calculator. All right, so let's get started. What we have is a pet store claims that the mean annual cost for routine vet visits are the same for cats and dogs. The mean cost for random samples of the two types of pets are shown below. Assume the population is normally distributed and the variances are not equal. At alpha equals 0.05, can you reject the pet store's claim? Okay, so I had told you that this is going to be a two sample t-test, um, but some things that help me to realize that is number one, we are dealing with a mean. So anytime we're dealing with a mean, we're either going to deal with a t-test or a z-test. Um, that means that when I set up my null hypothesis, I'm going to use mu as my symbol for the mean. And I know it's a two sample t-test because we're comparing two types of pets. We're co comparing cats and dogs. And cats and dogs are independent of each other, so that's why I know that they're independent. Um, if you have dependent samples, like a before and an after, like um, shooting free throws before practice and then again after practice to see how well you do when you're tired, that would be dependent and you would do a different test, which I will address in another video. Um, but for this one, because dogs and cats are independent of each other, we are going to use a two sample T test. Okay, um, so let me go ahead and write down some of the conditions that in order to use this, different textbooks have different conditions, so always reference your textbook. I may not cover all of them that are in your text. Um, the text that I'm currently looking for, the first thing to know whether you use a z-test or a t-test is what kind of standard deviation you have. So in this case, because we have the sample standard deviation, um, we... So let me write this down, sample standard deviations are known and the population, and I just put sigma one and sigma two, um, let me fix that really quickly. So sigma one and sigma two are unknown. So we don't know the population standard deviation. If you know the population standard deviation, then you run a two sample Z test. Um, when you know the sample standard deviation, then you are going to use the two sample T test. That's the only difference between the two tests um, is whether you know the sample standard deviation. Another thing that you always want to have to, to control bias is you have to have a random sample. And in order for the central limit theorem to kick in, your population either has to be approximately normally distributed or you have to have a sample size greater than 30. So um, since our sample size is not greater than 30, we couldn't automatically we use it, but we do have in here stated that the population is normally distributed. All right, so since the conditions are met, we are going to use a two sample t-test. So for this one, what it says is that the claim is that they are the same. So a pet store claims that the mean cost are the same. So that means there is no difference between the two. So there's two ways that you could set this up symbolically. Um, for this population, we're going to use mu1. For this population, we're going to use mu2 when we're setting up our null and our alternatives. So our null and our alternatives are always for the entire population, not the samples. So we don't ever use x bar in the null and the alternative. So one way of putting it is that we could say that mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero. So that means there is no difference. Or um, a lot of people like to write it as mu1 equals mu2. It just kind of makes more sense that there is no difference between the two. But sometimes you might be saying that the difference is one. So then you would have to set it up this way. Okay. Um, and then the alternative is always the opposite. Remember that the 
Null hypothesis always has to have a statement of equality, and the alternative always has to have a statement of inequality. So no matter what your claim is about, the null hypothesis always gets equals or greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. Um, the alternative is always an inequality statement, so like not equal, less than, greater than. So you always want to keep track of that. It's also important to know which one our claim is about. So our claim is about the null hypothesis because that helps us interpret our decision in context. So our claim is that there is no difference between the two. I'm going to go ahead and sketch out a model, but I'm not going to shade it until I actually run it in my calculator. I'm going to show you how to draw the picture um, in your calculator. You can't do it in the calculator screen for the TI Inspire. To get it to draw, you have to do it in a spreadsheet screen. So I will show you um, how to get the results in the spreadsheet screen. Okay, um, so let's write down all of our important, or really I'm not going to rewrite it because it's right here in the table. So we're going to use this important information right here. Because this is a t-test and it's um, a two-sample t-test for independent samples, um, our degrees of freedom are going to be the smaller of the first sample size minus one or the second sample size minus one. So what we're going to do is look at our sample sizes. So this one is 20 and this one is 24. So the smaller one is 20, so our degrees of freedom would end up being 19 because 20 minus 1 is 19. So if you were using a table, that would help you out. Um, it did tell us to use a critical value of 0 0.05, so we're going to compare our p-value to our alpha level. All right, as far as the result of your standardized test statistic, your calculator will give you that. Um, but we do need to know the formula just in case you have to show work. Um, so t is always going to be the first sample mean minus the second sample mean minus whatever we say the difference is, so mu1 minus mu2. In this case, and this is one of the reasons that we write it in this format, is to help us with the formula. Okay, Even though this means the same thing as this, um, as far as setting up the work, it's easier if we write the first notation, which is why I gave you both of them. Okay, and then we would divide it by the square root of the sample standard deviation, the first sample standard deviation squared divided by the sample size. Um, again, let me go back and address the fact of not pooling or pooling. At this point, there is a different standard error. This part right down here is called the standard error. And if you pool it together, you use a different formula for the denominator. So for this one, we are not pooling. Okay. Um, the reason we're not pooling is we don't know if the variances are equal. So unless you know that the variances between the two populations are equal, you do not want to pool. It's always safer not to pool than it is to pool because it can throw off your answer in the long run. So if you have a choice, I would not pool unless you know for a fact that the variances are equal to each other. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug in our numbers so that we can show our work. So our x bar 1 is 252. Our x bar 2 is 187. And then we're just going to subtract 0 because we said there is no difference. So really, I don't have to write that, but just so that you know that I did put the difference here. And then we have in the denominator, 28 squared is our sample standard deviation divided by our sample size of 20 plus 31 squared divided by 24. So I'm looking at my paper, but in case you're wondering where I got this information from, it came directly here. So x bar 1 minus x bar 2 divided by the sample standard deviation squared divided by the sample size 20. So that's where I got the values from that I plugged into my formula. So like I said, I'm going to use the calculator to help me find this value, and I'm also going to use the calculator to help us find our p-value. So let me go ahead and grab the calculator. And with this one, like I said, if you want to be able to sketch the picture, then you have to add a list and spreadsheet. So I'm going to add a list and spreadsheet. And then I'm just going to anywhere in here, it doesn't matter where, we can go to the menu and option four statistics. And then we're going to go to stat test, which is option four. And then we're going to put in our information from our chart. So our successes, x1, is going to be what is the mean of our samples. So that would be, I hold on, I 
just realized I grabbed two proportions z-test instead of, let me try that again, four, stat test is four, and it automatically selected. So I want number four, the two sample t-test. My pen was a little bit um, touchy there and did selected six instead. So let me select the correct one, the two sample t-test. And it's going to ask you, do you have the data? That means that you actually have information to plug into lists for both of them. Or do you have the stats? We have the stats, so I'm going to select OK. X bar 1 is 252. Um, our sample standard deviation for the first one was 28. Our sample size is 20. The, for the cats, it was 187 was the cost. The standard deviation was 31, and our sample size was 24. And then here you select what type of tests you have, whether you have greater than, not equal to, or less than in your alternative. So it's always your alternative. So we use not equal to. It's going to ask you, do you want to pool or not pool? We're going to select no for pooled. If you were pooling it, you would select yes, and it would change the denominator for the formula that you're using. So we're going to do no. This is just going to tell me where it's going to put the results in which column, and I'm going to select draw. And when I do this, it's going to draw the picture, but I'm not going to be able to see it very well. And the reason is, is because of the fact that they do split screens. So if you want to get rid of the split screen, you can do control and up and then click, whoops, sorry, control and up and then hit the menu and just ungroup. Okay, so now we can see the picture, and I'm going to go to the picture screen. Notice that my p-value is essentially zero, and that's because it only goes out to four decimal places. So um, my p-value is approximately zero. If I were to go back to the other screen, so if I hit control and left arrow back over to here, we can see our results, our p-value. And we can see that it's really 5.6226 E negative 9. So the E negative 9, remember, is scientific notation. So if I were to write this down, my p value is approximately 5.6226. The E negative 9 means times 10 to the negative 9. So if I were to write that out, that means that I would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight zeros before I write the other numbers, which is why in the other screen it's essentially zero. So basically, because this is so little, I'm barely going to shade anything. I just put a little bit of a shading so that I could show that I shaded. Um, but our p-value would be split between these two. So half of it would be here and half of it would be here. And our standardized test statistic is 7.30191. So this is very, very strong evidence. Anytime that you end up with something like this that's that extreme, that the p-value is practically zero, it's very strong evidence um, for this one. In this case, if we compare our p-value to alpha. Remember that our alpha was 0 0.05, so we're going to look at this value right here. So p-value is essentially 0. And that's definitely less than 0 0.05. And anytime it's less than or equal to, remember that we reject h sub 0. So we reject our null hypothesis. So if we go back up to our null hypothesis, that's telling us that it's not equal to zero. There is definitely a difference between the two. Um, so that means that the claim is ultimately wrong. And this is extremely strong evidence. If you get a p-value that's that close to zero, that means that by chance alone, um, it basically occurs 0% of the time if there really were no difference between the two. So we could say at 5%, there is significant evidence to reject the pet store's claim that there is no difference
between the mean annual cost, and this just came from the word problem. I'm just restating it back in context. So um, the mean annual cost of vet or of routine vet costs. between cats and dogs. And I think I got sidetracked because I was trying to talk at the same time. So there's significant evidence to reject the pet store's claim that there is no difference between the main annual cost of routine vet costs. Let me just change this part right here to four cats and dogs. Okay. Um, in this case, if you wanted to make a conclusion, we can see that um, the cost for dogs appears to be much higher. Based on this sample. All right, so just to recap, remember that any hypothesis test, you always start with the conditions for the test that you're looking at. Set up your nonlinear alternative, draw your picture, decide whether you're going to use a p-value decision rule. I use p-value if I'm using technology, and I use rejection region if I am um, not using technology. Show out your work, p-value, compare p-value to alpha, and then interpret your decision. As always, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know. If there are additional topics you need me to cover, please let me know that as well. And if you get a chance, I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe.